Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Duke. Welcome to segment three of our special topic lecture on fairy tales. Uh, we spent the first two periods talking, I think, in a lot of depth about what fairy tales were, what are their dynamics, uh, what is the ultimate aim of the fairy story, uh, and how really they're geared for adults as much as for children, how they are perhaps the stories, our most important stories, that allow us as adults to regain our lost wonder. Uh, and if you recall, uh, wonder is just the opposite side of the coin from, same side of the coin, I should say, uh, faith. One cannot have faith without wonder. Fairy tales are our preeminent ways of transferring wonder uh, and making sure that adults uh, remember what it was to wonder when they were kids. Uh, we get older, we get jaded, we get cynical. We remember, uh, many of us remember very clearly, uh, probably can point to the exact moment that we lost our wonder as children. When was it that we were forced to grow up and recognize the realities of adult life? We remember those things. Uh, the question is, can you be an adult? And that's the key. Can you be an adult and still have the kind of wonder uh, that Christ himself says is required to enter the kingdom of heaven? And so we did a good job, I think, the first two hours talking deeply about the philosophy, the theology, the import of fairy tales. What I'd like to talk about today uh, is introduce you to one of the world's preeminent fairy story writers, uh, somebody who has had an influence way, way beyond um, um, little kids. And it's somebody probably, unfortunately, that you haven't heard of. The fact that you have not heard more about George MacDonald, a Victorian writer, 19th century writer of fairy stories, uh, the fact that you haven't heard more about him and probably haven't read much of what he's written uh, is a travesty, and it's a commentary on how bland and materialistic reading in the 20th century had become in the 21st century. So I want to introduce you to George MacDonald, who was a tremendous influence on many, many serious, important writers in the 20th century and one of our great uh, artists of the fairy tale. Uh, if we go to our click, go to our stories, our notes. Who was George MacDonald? He was a uh, Protestant Scottish minister. He was born in 1824, did not die until 1905. So his career pretty much spanned the entire career of the Victorian England by the time uh, Victoria came to the throne and by the time she died. That's roughly the time that MacDonald live, lived. Uh, he was a Scottish poet. He was a minister. Uh, a teacher and a writer of fairy stories. And he was in interesting. As a minister, he was rather unorthodox. He, as far as ministering to his church went, he sort of rejected the more solemn pieties of Victorian England and Calvinistic philosophy. Uh, he believed in joy and love. Uh, and so his, his congregation was quite different than the ones uh, that were usually seen throughout the Victorian uh, and Scot English and Scottish countrysides. And as such, he ran afoul to some degree with the church authorities who wanted him to be more uh, orthodox and traditional. Uh, he was a bit of a, uh, a romantic, a poet, and a revolutionary Scottish poet, minister, teacher, and primarily we remember him for his fairy stories. He was also a pioneer of fantasy literature. The works that, um, that uh, MacDonald left us, including books like Fantasties and Lilith, are really the hallmarks, the, the, the entry-level hallmarks of what would become fantasy literature. He provided us with a tremendous uh, field of writing uh, to begin the, the, the evolving genre of fantasy literature that people like Tolkien would pick up and run with. Another influence, uh, he really influenced Tolkien as well as C.S. Lewis. He was also, in his own day, a friend, a good friend and mentor of, the, of Lewis Carroll, uh, author of Alice in Wonderland. In fact, uh, it, if it had not been for MacDonald's support and patronage, it's unlikely that Carroll ever would have released, published uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, he, uh, was, he would stay and visit MacDonald at the MacDonald home, uh, country home, and he would uh, talk to, to, to the kids of the many children that MacDonald had. And it was MacDonald's uh, continuing influence. MacDonald allowed Lewis Carroll to read Alice in Wonderland in manuscript to his children. And their wonderful reaction, plus the support of MacDonald, was what moved Lewis Carroll to finally go ahead and publish Alice in Wonderland. Uh, when he became moderately famous, he took an, a tour to America, where he became friends with some famous American writers, including Longfellow, Walt Whitman, and Mark Twain. Uh, Twain didn't like him at first, being a, a terrible realist, but even he, the, the magical realism with which MacDonald wrote began to grow on crusty old Mark Twain, and the two of them became friends as well. So a remarkable career he had, uh, even though he's sort of lapsed into uh, uh, obloquy today. We don't read him very much, and it's a pity we should. Uh, and if you take a look now at his major works, 
Um, he's very well known for his children's stories. The Princess and the Goblin, Goblin and The Princess and Curdie. These are books that are featured, by the way, very, very uh, deeply in our Freedom Project Academy curriculum for little kids. The Princess and the Goblin, The, Goblin, the Princess and Curdie, two masterpieces of the fairy tale genre. Uh, At the Back of the North Wind is a wonderful little story. And then two novels, Fantasties and Lilith. Fantasties was the book that awakened, uh, helped awaken faith in C.S. Lewis. When Lewis wrote Fantasties, he picked it up at a bookstall when he was traveling by train and happened to read it on the train, he said that, that that book woke his imagination and prepared him for eventual belief in gods, how powerful that book was. Lilith is a classic uh, of, of fantasy literature as well. So uh, he, he, the one book I didn't li I list so far is, I think, perhaps his most famous. It's also the most simple. It's The Light Princess. It's the one we're going to be talking about for the remainder of today and for our final hour next week. The Light Princess is a, it is the, to me, it is the penultimate, it is the ultimate fairy tale. Uh, it has everything you want in a fairy tale story. It is light and humorous. It is breezy. It is deeply theological. It is profoundly uh, philosophical. The Light Princess was published in 1864, uh, and it was influenced by Sleeping Beauty, a story that had origins going way beyond, uh, way back before Disney. Influenced by the original story of Sleeping Beauty, it's a fairy story about a princess afflict afflicted with weightlessness, and this is kind of a beautiful premise. A young princess is born, and due to some witchcraft and some chicanery, uh, there's always a, 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 a wicked character in these fairy tales, she is stripped of her gravity, which means that she floats, that unless she's held down or anchored some way, she'll float away to the clouds. Uh, and it becomes a wonderful metaphor. It's a beautiful story for kids. The idea of a giggling princess who has no gravity, who the minute you let her go, the minute she flies away, she can be buffeted away like a kite by winds. Um, that's a wonderful image for little kids, but it also has all sorts of adult connotations. When we think about what gravity means, gravity doesn't just mean the ability to feel weight, the ability to be uh, anchored to the earth by the force of gravity. It also means gravitas. It also means depth. It also means wisdom. It also means seriousness. So The Light Princess works on so many levels. It's a perfect story for little kids in the nursery. It is a wonderful story uh, for burgeoning young adults and for adults who need to be reminded uh, and amused by what fairy tales have to offer. So it's a story about a fairy uh, tale princess who's afflicted with weightlessness. And in a typical Christian connotation, what is it that will eventually come to give the princess back her gravity? And that is love and suffering. Love and suffering. Falling in love and suffering for love is the, are the only things that can restore her gravity. And so uh, McDonald begins with a wonderful point that little kids can take in, but adults really need, that love and suffering for love uh, are the only things that give us gravity, uh, that give us depth, that give us uh, empathy of the kind that Christ said is required to enter the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So when we look at this, we have to keep those things in mind. And uh, look, before we begin, in the, the, the fairy tale. Before we take a look at The Light Princess, I'd like to take a moment and share with you what some of the great writers of the 20th century, some that we've already seen, people like G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, uh, what they had to say about the influence of George MacDonald's writing on their own careers. Chesterton said uh, that The Princess and the Goblin is the most real, the most realistic in the exact sense of the phrase, the most lifelike of any story of I, I have ever read. And if you saw our lecture last week, part two, you would see how important Ch uh, Chesterton was uh, as a Christian apologist for understanding and realizing and calling to prominence some of the great fairy tale writers that had come before him. And of course, MacDonald was his favorite. And I love what he says there. As we saw in the theoretical part last period, last section, uh, these fairy tales for him are the most real. Fairy writing, writing about Elfland, the ethics of Elfland, the land of the elves, is much more real and true than what we encounter daily. And of all the stories that moved Chesterton, The Princess and the Goblin was the most real, the most realistic, in the exact sense of the phrase, the most lifelike. Uh, and it, for Chesterton, the book made a difference to my whole existence. It changed his entire way of thinking and believing. Same thing happened to C.S. Lewis. Chesterton was a believer, and it changed him, made him a deeper believer. Lewis was not a believer, and this book, his books, MacDonald's books, were huge catalysts uh, to provide the foundation from which Lewis's Christian faith would eventually spring. Uh, C.S. Lewis on MacDonald. Uh, I love some of these quotes. Lewis said, I have never concealed the fact that I regarded MacDonald 
as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. Let that sink in for a moment. Lewis was one of the most diverse, fascinating, complicated, variegated writers we've ever had. He excelled. I make the, whenever we talk about Lewis and Tolkien in my classrooms at the university, I like to point out a couple of things that Tolkien, who gave us that wonderful fairy world of Middle Earth, Tolkien did one thing better than perhaps anybody else had ever done it. He created, he, he sub-created under the creation of God, he sub-created an entire universe with multiple languages and races and all sorts of history. Even the geography and topography of, of Tolkien's stories are so precise and exact that people today delight in reading the maps and making maps uh, to show these wonderful places of Middle Earth. Tolkien did one thing in the land of fairy that perhaps nobody had ever done before in terms of its, its complexity. Lewis on the other hand, did about 12 things uh, as good as anybody else had done them. You think about his fairy stories, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, which, uh, has, which just reek, if I may use that word, of the glory of MacDonald's own light princess and his princess stories. Uh, the, the fairy tale activities of Lewis were fantastic, but you also had Christian apologetics, you had fiction, you had uh, science fiction, you had literary criticism, you had all sorts of wonderful venues and avenues in which the genius of Lewis was sparked. And so when Lewis says in that quote, I have never written a book, not one book, not his literary scholarship, not his science fiction, not a single book he wrote, that wasn't, and that he did not quote from MacDonald, that he did not have MacDonald in mind when he wrote it. That's remarkable. Lewis wrote very serious academic scholarship. He wrote very serious fiction and science fiction. Besides his fairy tale work, he was a master of Christian apologetics, and MacDonald was in his ear uh, every single time. So much so that if you ever read a gr The Great Divorce, which is Lewis's uh, account of what the afterlife is like. Uh, the great divorce is what it's like to die and go to heaven or not go, depending upon uh, how you choose uh, once you're in the little gray town. Uh, the great divorce, when Lewis gets on the bus, the, the spirit, the soul of Lewis gets on the bus that takes souls to heaven. When he gets off the bus in heaven, the first person who comes to meet him is George MacDonald. The spirit of MacDonald comes over the mountains his teacher, his mentor. It's a beautifully poetic meeting between Lewis and the man he loved but never met, uh, never met MacDonald. Lewis would have been a very little boy when MacDonald died. Uh, but this idea that when Lewis gets to heaven, the first person that's going to come and welcome him and carry him over the mountains is his mentor, MacDonald. Uh, continuing with our Lewis quotes, Lewis said, I know nothing that gives me such a feeling of spiritual healing, of being washed as to read George MacDonald. That's beautiful. It's the baptismal imagery of it all, right? I know nothing, no other work, no other literature. And this is a, a professor of English at the University of Oxford and then Cambridge. Lewis was absolutely familiar with literary trends from the classical world all the way through the modern. And yet he still, he still knew of no other book, not Shakespeare, not Milton, not the Bible. He knew of no other work that gave him such a feeling of spiritual healing, of being washed, washed clean. Now, that's the wonder of fairy tales, right? That which stains our souls, that which pulls us down, makes us jaded, makes us lose our wonder. He, he, the fairy tale washed him clean of that, like a kind of baptism. And then uh, another quote from Lewis. So many clever writers strike one as quite childish after MacDonald. They seem not to understand so many things. And I love that too. So many realistic, worldly, so many heavy duty and complicated and dense writers. Uh, they, compared to McDonald, they just seem kind of silly. Uh, childish is the word he uses, right? So many clever writers strike one as quite childish after McDonald. They don't understand. And I think that's right. If we lose faith, if we lose our ability to wonder, which is the conduit to faith, if we can no longer see the world as a miracle or a mystery, if we see everything pragmatically, rationally, scientifically, if we reduce ourselves to that, uh, we really have wandered down a dark path. Uh, the world closes in upon us. Um, even the universe as conceived by scientists is one great cosmic prison house that we can't break out of. Uh, and so if we lose those, that capacity to wonder uh, the way MacDonald does so aptly in his fairy tales, uh, then we've really lost everything. We've, we've sold our soul for nothing. What profited a man if he do gain the whole world and lose his soul? And that's what happens when we have lost the ability to wonder. Uh, W.H. Auden 
who was an amazing, amazing 20th century poet, critic, writer, uh, a deep thinker himself. Auden, too, was deeply, deeply inspired by Lewis. What did Auden have to say about George MacDonald? He said, George MacDonald is preeminently a mythopoeic writer. Remember we talked about mythopoesis. That's the way Tolkien wrote, to write poetically the language of the other world, right? To be a writer of that which is metaphysical, beyond rational, uh, beyond human, uh, the land of Elfland, right? George MacDonald is preeminently a mythopoeic writer in his power to project his inner life into images, events, beings, landscapes, which are valid for everyone. He is one of the most remarkable writers of the 19th century. To me, Auden continued, George MacDonald's most extraordinary and precious gift is his ability in all his stories to create an atmosphere of goodness about which there is nothing phony or moralistic. Nothing is rarer in literature. And that last comment needs to be expanded upon. He creates an atmosphere of genuine goodness in his fairy tales. Genuine good. And of course, that means that there is genuine evil, too. But he creates an atmosphere of genuine goodness in his fairy stories. Uh, So much so that there is nothing phony or moralistic about it. Oftentimes, uh, these kinds of writings can become pedantic or demeaning or condescending, moralistic. Lectures for little children about what they should and shouldn't do, not organic stories that touch children from within, even if they don't always know what the message is. Uh, To create an atmosphere of goodness about which there is nothing phony or moralistic, that is the hardest thing in all of literature to do. And the writings of Lewis, the writings of Tolkien do it, and certainly the writings of MacDonald create worlds, uh, worlds of tremendous goodness and innocence. But there's nothing uh, Hollywood about it. There's been no selling out. There's, there's no uh, under, undertones of something deeper and wickeder. When he creates good, he creates good in a way that is accessible. And it's not mealy-mouthed or watered down or politicized in any way. And so Auden is, I think, quite prescient in understanding the genius of George MacDonald. And if we begin our look at, the, at George MacDonald, let's take a look at The Light Princess. Let's take a look at one uh, really, really compelling fairy tale as a way of trying to understand all of the elements we've talked about in Lesson 1, Lesson 2, and now Lesson 3, all of that philosophy, history, uh, philology, all of that interest in linguistics and uh, morality and ethics. So what is The Light Princess about? It's about, as I said, a uh, king and queen, a fairy tale king and queen. Uh, they have no children. And that, of course, is a problem in fairy tales, as it is in the Bible, right? Uh, Childlessness is a wonderful way in the Bible for God to show his power and his love. And so, too, in fairy tales, you oftentimes see uh, children, orphans, you oftentimes see parents without children, the inability to have them. It's a common fairy tale trope. And in this case, we have a king and a queen who have no child, and it's a problem. And the king, of course, blamed it all on his wife. So the king tried to have patience without having any kids. He tried to have patience, but he succeeded very badly. It was more than he deserved, therefore, when at last the queen gave him a daughter, as lovely a little princess as ever cried. And that's really beautiful, right? Uh, King Lear, Shakespeare and King Lear points out that the first time we smell the air, we wail and cry, we wall and cry. And that should teach us what life is, Shakespeare says. Lear, old Lear, right, in his madness. He's got a point. The first thing we do when we're born is cry, not laugh, right, not contemplate, uh, not pontificate. The first thing we do as humans when we are born is to cry. And that's, uh, I think, a beautiful reminder of the world we're entering is a fallen world. The world of fairy tales are fallen worlds, right? The, the point of fairy tales is not to unmake fallen humanity. It is to remind us of what we were before we fell. And it's a beautiful premise, the fall. The king tried to have patience, but he succeeded very badly. It was more than this old king deserved then, when at last the queen gave him a daughter, as lovely a little princess as ever cried. The day drew near, of course, when they were going to baptize the little girl. The day drew near when the infant must be christened. And so, a couple of things. At her birth, the princess has not yet been cursed. So she does have gravity, right? And gravity, that that sense of sadness, the sorrow of our fall, she has it. And so the first thing the princess does, like all babies when she's born, is cry when she greets the new world. 
And so a few days go by, eight days generally, and the Bible tells us before, uh, before you have these ceremonies. What's going to happen is, is that the little baby, with her gravity, typical human princess, is going to be taken to the church to be baptized. The day drew near when the infant must be christened. The king wrote all the invitations with his own hand. Of course, somebody was forgotten. Now, it does not generally matter if somebody is forgotten. Only, you must mind who you forget to invite. Unfortunately, the king forgot without intending to forget. And so the chance fell upon the princess make him know it. Love that name, right? Fairy tale name if ever I heard one. She'll make him know it, all right. Princess make him know it. His sister, which was quite awkward. For the princess was the king's own sister, and he ought not to have forgotten her. And here you have your fairy tale tension. The king forgets to invite his own sister. Now, the fact that she is a surly, unfriendly, hostile, wicked princess uh, doesn't change the fact that he neglects her. And as we know, fairy tale villains always have the capacity to revenge. So he forgot the wrong person the king did. And so what does Miss make him know? What does Princess make him know it do? Well, what did she do on the day of the christening? Make him know it, put on her best gown, went to the palace, was kindly received by the happy monarch who forgot that he had forgotten and took her place in the procession to the royal chapel. When they were all gathered about the baptismal font, she contrived to get next to it and throw something into the water. Now, this is an interesting thing. Water is going to play an absolutely huge role in this story uh, because what was it that washed away sin? Uh, John the Baptist and, and water. What did uh, the Baptist use to cleanse those that were guilty and sinful? Water. And what was it also that destroyed the world after the fall? It was water, right? The story of Noah and the ark. Uh, water becomes a huge, huge uh, liquid here uh, in, in the story because of both of what it can do and what it means and what it symbolizes and how water can be used to wash away sin and guilt, but it could also be used to wash away sinners and guilty people in the story of Noah. And so it becomes really powerful. And this baptismal water, this water at the font that is supposed to purify this fallen princess, as we're all fallen when we're born into this world, and to prepare her for life with Christ, both in this world and in the next. It is the wicked princess, make him know it, who's going to corrupt that water. She's going to take that which is holy, and she's going to pollute it and curse it. When, th- when they were all gathered around about the font, she contrived to get next to it and throw something into the water, after which she maintained a very respectful demeanor till the water was applied to the child's face. Once this corrupted water was put on the baby's face to to bless her, at that moment, Princess Makem know it turned round in her place three times and muttered the following words, loud enough for those beside her to hear her. Light of spirit, by my charms, light of body, every part, never weary human arms, only crush thy parent's heart. Light of spirit, by my charms, right? So to be heavy spirited is to be deep, is to be baptized, it is to be initiated uh, into the truths of the religion and to receive the grace of God. Remember uh, the, the Holy Spirit descending, uh, the voice of the Spirit, the Spirit of, of the Lord descending upon Jesus after he was baptized, that power that comes, the grace that comes with baptism sacramentally. In this case, the baby's been baptized with corrupted water, and that's going to make her light of spirit. It's going to make her unable to see, to feel, to empathize. Light of spirit by my charms, light of body, every part. Never weary human arms. And I love that, right? It seems almost like, in a way, doesn't it almost seem like a a blessing? By the dictates of our material world, by the dictates of the world we now live in, a world that has rejected so much of the wisdom of the Bible and the wisdom of Christianity, so much of the wisdom of fairy tales. Uh, We've chosen a rational path. Then you think about modern culture. One of the things we do all the time is uh, we grow up kids too fast. We're growing up kids at an extraordinary rate. We won't let little children be little children. What with the um, uh, the sexualization of kids in the schools now, incorporating you know graphic sexual lessons in elementary and middle school, forcing kids too young to think about 
sex at all, to consider transgenderism, the politicization of the classroom, the politicization of science for little kids. We are making them little adults. Think about how they're bombarded. So I read somewhere that by the time a child is two years old, they will have seen tens of thousands of violent images in, on TV, in, their, in, 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 in the, the media they're exposed to. It's absolutely corrupting for little kids. And remember what Christ said, woe unto you who corrupteth one of them. Woe unto you who are the cause by which little children are forced not to be anymore. Now they're transformed into little adults with all the burdens and the misery and the, uh, the corruption that uh, adults have suffered through and imbibed. To do that to children is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And so here, in, in the, the language of the 21st century, materialist, rationalist, scientific, doesn't it almost seem like you could read it like a blessing? Go back to the curse. Light of spirit by my charms, light of body, every part. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to float? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to let go of gravity and just soar to the clouds? And not only light of spirit, i.e. spiritually light, uh, no stains, no depression, no sadness, no suffering to hold the, the child down metaphysically, but the body too. The body too is light in every part, that if for a moment the nurses let go of her, she begins to sail to the ceiling. Light of spirit by my charms, light of body, every part, never weary human arms. That's the other thing. She is so light of body that when her nurses carry her, when her mother holds her, uh, there's no weight. Uh, as the, the, the princess grows and grows as a little baby, uh, she doesn't get any heavier. So she's, she, and there's a beautiful moral there, right? That this little girl will never weary human arms. Because now that here, here's where the curse comes in. Though. Is it really a blessing or is it a curse? The idea that she never wearies human arms, she never becomes a burden, doesn't it also mean uh, that she can never really be loved? Uh, to love something the correct way is to suffer for it, is to be willing to suffer for it. Uh, here you have a lot of lightness, a lot of uh, weightlessness, no gravity. But is there a, a, a double-edged sword here? It's really easy when you think about what matters to us as materialist people. Uh, it's very easy to see this perhaps as a blessing. We'll see as the story unfolds. It's not a blessing at all. If you look at that, though, never weary human arms, but you will crush your parents' heart, right? That it's uh, not the physical burdens of life that crush us. It's the spiritual ones. And so she's light of spirit, light of body. She will not physically weigh anybody down, but she is going to crush her parents' heart. Why? And I think you have to understand from a fairy tale perspective to get the logic of that. It's a beautiful little curse, right? Uh, it's very much a modern one. What we want is lighthearted children. We want kids to have lots of self-esteem, even though if they've never done anything to earn it. We want kids to have no boundaries. We want kids to be able to uh, explore. I mean, if we're allowing kids as young as four and five to determine their gender, we have really jettisoned uh, anything heavy. The idea that would have kids would have to come to groups with problems, uh, and how much. Uh, when we find kids incapable of being light princesses themselves, completely devoid of depth and substance that are brought about by pain, uh, how, how often do we fill that void with medicine and pharmaceuticals uh, to force kids to become something uh, other than they were meant to be, not to come to grips with what they suffer, but oftentimes to mask what they suffer uh, through pharmaceutical medicines. Even our pharmacology now is designed to take away from children that which might give them this kind of depth. So in spite of all those seemingly wonderful quali qualities, she has light of spirit, she has light of body, right? Wouldn't it be kind of neat just to leave ground and soar among the clouds? Uh, but there's still that, that codicil there, right? That in spite of all of that, she'll never weary human arms with her body weight, but she certainly is going to provide problems for the human heart as we move forward. And so once that she's cursed, Princess Makem know it recedes again into the background, and we find the first awkwardness. The first awkwardness that resulted from this unhappy privation of gravity was that the moment the nurse began to float the baby up and down, as we often do, right? Bounce babies up and down a little bit, throw it up and down. As she flew for the minute the, the, the nurse tossed the baby, she flew from the nurse's arms and towards the ceiling. Happily, <clears throat> the resistance of the air brought her ascending career to a close within a foot of it, right? As the, the air rose up in, the, in, the, in the, the castle, right? There was a kind of a little 
bumper of air between the actual ceiling and her head. And so she just sort of floated there about a foot from the ceiling. Horizontal, as when she left her nurse's arms, kicking and laughing amazingly. The nurse, in terror, flew to the bell and begged the footman who answered it to bring up the house steps, the ladder, immediately. Trembling in every limb, the nurse climbed up on the steps and had to st stand on the very tip-top and reach up before she could catch the floating tail of the baby's long clothes. And so you have this really beautiful child, fairy tale childhood image, right? That this uh, lighter than gossamer, unweighed down by the realities of life, this princess just floats and sort of hovers there at the top of the, uh, of the, top of the castle, floating, floating, floating until she can, the nurse can scramble up a ladder, grab onto the end of her clothes and sort of haul her back down. Beautiful fairy tale imagery with lots of philosophical significance beneath it. The light princess. She may be light, but she's not empty. Despite the fact that this caused a lot of trouble, you can imagine what the king and the queen were thinking, right? That unless the baby were anchored or tied down or held down, it was going to sail away. There's a wonderful episode in the story where uh, at one point, the, the, it's summertime, and so it's warm. And so the baby's sleeping in her crib, and they've got her slightly weighed down, when all of a sudden, one of the windows is open to bring a little breeze in. And unbeknownst to the, uh, the nurse, a little gust of wind sweeps into the window, carries the light princess out of her crib and out the opposite window. And she goes f floating along like a balloon, right, all across the, la the grounds of the, camp of the castle. And they, it's a wonderfully hysterical story about how all the king's horses and all the king's men are out there trying to get, get her back. They finally do. They're finally able to uh, bring her back. The wind blows her under a rose bush where the little child falls asleep and the rose bushes are holding her down. And when they find her in her little white sleeper, she's covered with red rose petals, quite a beautiful fairy tale image. And they take her back. This causes great consternation for mom and dad, the king and queen, because they don't know what they're going to do. How do you marry a princess like this to somebody to be able to, to court alliances and secure the, the, the future of the kingdom? How do you uh, deal with a princess that has no gravity? And so they're very frustrated by it. But the other side of the coin is, is that in spite of all of their frustrations, undeniably the lightness, you think about the title of the fairy tale, <clears throat> the light princess. The word light has so many different connotations. Light as in not heavy, but light can also be uh, a term to refer to frivolous, can't it? Light is frivolous. Light is superficial. Uh, light is airy. Light is fluff. There's also that as well. Light is also humorous, right? Light-tempered, light-minded, light-humored. And there are all sorts of wonderful, wonderful associations with gravity and with lightness, uh, weight, uh, falling, and that if you have a chance to sit down and read the whole fairy tale, and you can read it. It's a beautiful short fairy tale. You can read it in one sitting to your kids. Uh, it's about 100 pages, but uh, very, very big writing and quite easily digestible in a, in a sitting or two. But it's always wonderful for adults, puns and parallels and turns of phrase on what light means, despite the fact that she was a burden to her parents. As she, even though she had no way, the fact that she could always fly away, there was nothing in her that anchored her here with the rest of us, right? And uh, she, we, we've seen it time and time again already. What is it that we all have in common undeniably? What's the thing that we most have in common? It's the fact that as human animals, human creatures, human uh, beings made in the image of God, we suffer. Uh, we suffer because the world is a fallen world. The bodies that were given, these flesh and blood bodies that die, that decompose, they are never what we were meant to be. We were meant to be in the Garden of Eden and not suffer change or time or disease or death. Uh, but the consequence of our bad choices has burdened us, right? Made our arms heavy with the reality of physicality, corporeality. But the little girl doesn't have that. She is free from those problems, seemingly not anchored and tied. But what, is, what she doesn't also have is the empathy, empathy, the gravity, the seriousness that comes from the recognition of what we are. She's disconnected. She's not part of what it means to be human. Uh, and so despite the fact that she is a burden to her, fa her parents, she also has that lightheartedness. Go to the next clip. Despite the fact that it was a good deal to care for her, right? But there was never a baby in a house, not to say a palace that kept the household in such constant good humor. That's the, one of the beauties of the story, right? 
at least below stairs. Mom and dad, king and queen may be upset, upset about all this, but the staff, the help, the nannies, the footmen, right? They loved her. If it was not easy for her nurses to hold her, at least she made neither their arms nor their hearts ache. And she was so nice to play at ball with, they could throw her back and forth like a ball. There was positively no danger of letting her fall. They might throw her down, or knock her down, or push her down, but they couldn't let her down. It is true, they might let her fly into the fire, or the coal hole, or through the window, but none of these accidents had happened as yet. If you heard peals of laughter resounding from some unknown region, you might be sure enough of the cause. And what's beautiful about that, before we move off of it, uh, is the fall. There's something ominous there, isn't there? Despite the good humor, she was a plaything, she was a toy, and you really couldn't hurt her. You could push her down, you could knock her down, she could fall down, but she'd fall up. But there's the problem, isn't it? There was positively no danger of letting her fall. What does it mean to not be able to fall? And how does one enter love if they can't fall into it? There's a reason we use the phrase falling in love, right? Because it is a kind of fall. Uh, it's a, a dangerous, vulnerable fall, right? To fall, the fall of man and to fall into love. Uh, there's a reason we use the word fall here because there is a coming down before there is a rising up. To fall into love is to, be, is to become vulnerable, is to become susceptible. Uh, it is to open the doors to suffering, to be, to, because love is always, to love somebody correctly isn't just to be happy, it's also to be concerned for them. It's to worry about them. It is to love them to the degree uh, that any hurt or fear or danger to them becomes our hurt and fear and danger. Uh, but that's something that's completely missing from the light princess. She can't fall. That has tremendous theological implications in the story, but it also has tremendous implications for love and the ability to love somebody else. If you can't fall in love, how can you ever suffer for another? And I think MacDonald has a really brilliant uh, series of puns and misdirections happening here. If you go back to the quote, she was so nice to play at ball with, but there was no positively no danger of letting her fall. They might throw her down, knock her down, push her down, but they could not let her down. It is true. They might let her fly. Perhaps one day maybe she would by accident fly, fly into the fire or up the coal hole or through the window, but none of these accidents had yet has happened. If you heard peals of laughter resounding from some unknown region, you might be sure enough of the cause. She's gotten up the corner stairs or she's floating above the main palace door, right? But she was always laughing. Everything made her laugh, which made them laugh. Well, at least below the stairs. For mom and dad, it was a serious issue. Go back to the next slide. In fact, is it possible to laugh too much? Is it possible that a world filled only with laughter becomes not a comedy but a tragedy? And can you really laugh, can you really appreciate laughter if you don't know sadness? Can you really appreciate humor and gaiety and joy if you don't know what sets them off from everything else? And that's the point McDonald makes here. Meantime, notwithstanding awkward occurrences, and griefs that she brought upon her parents. The awkward occurrence of her flying out a window, for instance, or the grief that she brought upon her parents because she had no weight. The little princess laughed and grew, not fat, but plump and tall. She reached the age of 17 without having fallen into any worse scrape than a chimney. And again, do you notice how often the word fall <clears throat> keeps coming up here in McDonald? She reached the age of 17 without having fallen into any worse scrape than a chimney, by rescuing her from which a little bird nesting urchin got fame and a black face. Right? They sent the chimney sweep up the chimney to get her. Nor, thoughtless as she was, had she committed anything worse than laughter at everybody and everything that came in her way, the worst you could say about her is that she laughed at everyone. Now, there's a difference, isn't there, between laughing with people and laughing at them. And the princess had no gravity to determine the difference. She would laugh at the most inopportune times, at other people's sorrow. Uh, death itself provoked laughter. 
because there was nothing in her but lightness. When she was told, for instance, for the sake of experiment, that the king's general, Clanrenfort, was cut to pieces with all his troops, she laughed. When she heard that the enemy was on his way to besiege her papa's capital, she laughed hugely. But when she was told that the city would certainly be abandoned to the mercy of the enemy soldiers, why, then she laughed immoderately. She never could be brought to see the serious side of anything. And this almost seems like we're being contradictory. Are you saying, Pesta, is McDonald saying that you got to take this child and corrupt her? No, that's not what we're saying. Uh, the purpose of fairy tales, as you recall, is to begin to familiarize little children with the, the, the great suffering of life, the great realities of, of a fallen human world in moderate doses so that the time they reach adulthood, they are not surprised by war, the, the images we just saw there, war or tyranny or oppression. You've got to begin to instill those things. Fairy tales allows you, for children, the, the purpose of fairy tales for kids is to allow you to begin to introduce to children serious adult subjects that they're going to have to come to grips with in ways that allow them to remain little kids, right? Without traumatizing them or horrifying them or realistically or scientifically conferring upon them truths and realities and information that are way too difficult for little kids to properly come to grips with. Fairy tales give you the perfect medium to do this. But here she is 17. She is not a little girl anymore. And she has not because she has no gravity. She has no, no ability to understand or feel or empathize with weighty things like suffering and death. That at 17, when she's not a little girl anymore, her response to murder, to the destruction of the king's armies, to the possibility that the kingdom itself, her own castle, might be overrun with enemy soldiers, she just laughs more and more and more. And now you begin to see the problem of, of this in a way. She is a fairy tale princess that has not suffered the way fairy tale princesses do. All fairy tale princesses, or princes for that matter, all fairy tale heroes, they find themselves in positions where, uh, because of their ideals, because of what it is they believe and stand for, they are persecuted. They suffer. And it is through their suffering that fairy tale characters uh, become greater than they are. Uh, they, the, the triumph of the fairy tale is not joy. And the triumph of the fairy tale is not suffering. The triumph of the fairy tale is to suffer, but not allow that suffering to dampen your joy, but instead increase it. That's wonder, right? Uh, that's faith. And so the fairy tale princess at the beginning of the story, she's suffering without knowing it. She suffers from a lack of weight, gravity, empathy. She cannot fall. She cannot fall into, she can't fall and sc scrape her knee any more than she can fall in love. Uh, and that's the problem of the story. And it's really beautifully rendered. She could, finish the quote there, she could never be brought to see the serious side of anything. You go to the next one. The narrator, McDonald. And can you just to see, can you just imagine McDonald with his kids, right? McDonald uh, had a very long beard, very Victorian long beard, very uh, serious looking fella. But he used to love to act out his own fairy tales. He would get the kids together and they would put on little skits in the house for visitors or for Christmas holiday. Uh, very dramatic when he went to America, McDonald, to read his own fairy tales uh, to, to packed houses of audiences. Uh, he would read them in very dramatic and very fun ways. He'd do the voices. And here the moderator, McDonald, introduces himself into the story. I, I may here remark that it was very amusing to see her run. If her mode of progression could properly be called running. For f the only way you could uh, slow the princess down is if you gave her something from the human world, like a, a rock or a stone or a, a, a heavy candlestick, right? You put something heavy in her hands, it would hold her down. So she herself had no gravity, but the things of the world still did. So sometimes she would be forced to hold on to heavy things or sit in a chair with something heavy in her lap. And so that it did allow her to kind of walk a little bit, I may remark here that it was very amusing to see her run if her mode of progression could properly be called running. For first she would make a bound, and then having landed, she would run a few steps and then make another bound, right? 
sometimes, so she would bounce, right? Her, she would soar a little bit and then come down a little bit. Uh, she, sometimes she would fancy she had reached the ground before she actually had, and her little feet would go backwards and forwards, running upon nothing at all, like those of a chicken on its back. And then she would laugh like the very spirit of fun. Only, in her laugh, there was something missing. What it was, I find myself unable to describe. I think it was a certain tone, depending upon the possibility of sorrow. Morbidezza, perhaps. She never smiled. Man, right? You think about the joy. Can you imagine? It's almost like running on the moon. Remember those images we had of the astronauts bounding on the moon, right? Where there was almost no gravity, much, much less gravity than on Earth. And they would leap in their heavy astronaut suits, right? It would seem like they would go up and then pull back down a little bit, right? And then, then leap up again. It's exactly before, you know, 100 years before the moon landing, McDonald had sort of this figured out in his head. And without that gravity, it seems like a wonderful fun. But look at the turn. Look at the turn in the language. She would laugh like the very spirit of fun, only in her laugh there was something missing. It's a remarkable image. What that thing was, MacDonald says, don't quite know how to describe it, but I think it was a certain tone that spelled the possibility of sorrow. Morbidezza, morbidity, right? And she never smiled. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the princess is constantly, eternally laughing, but she never once smiles. She's never all her life ever smiled at anything. Now, there's something about it that's powerful, right, that this is all frivolity without something to ground us. It is silly. It is fluffy. It is insubstantial her humorous mood. And everybody around her thought was contagious, right? She'd giggle, they'd giggle. But their giggles were anchored in the knowledge that she is so different from them. Her giggles are anchored in nothing. Go to the next one. And the fall, right? Perhaps, maybe, the best thing for the princess would have been to fall in love. But how a princess who had no gravity could fall into anything? That's the difficulty. Perhaps the difficulty. As for her own feelings on the subject, she didn't even know that there was such a beehive of honey and stings to be fallen into. That is one of the most gorgeous passages in MacDonald. And it is beautiful in the sense that uh, the way he describes it, uh, the, the, fair, the absolute fairy tale elements that make up the quote, perhaps the best thing for the princess would have been to fall in love. And then that, that falling in, right? That becoming vulnerable. To fall in love is to become vulnerable to love. It is to open yourself up to hurt, right? To fall in love is the only way you can love. But how can a princess who had none of these gravitational qualities, metaphysically as well as humanly, how could she fall into anything? That's the problem, isn't it? What are we? And is suffering in this world really the enemy? Suffering overcome. Suffering survived with faith. Suffering that deepens us and broadens us and makes us more empathetic. That's what grows us up. That's what grows us closer to God. And it is perhaps the, the difficulty here for the princess that she couldn't fall into anything. Not only could she not fall, she, because she couldn't fall, because she couldn't become vulnerable, because she couldn't suffer, because she knew no pain or sorrow, nor heartache. She couldn't love. She couldn't empathize. She did not even know that such a thing as love existed. And look at the way McDonald describes falling in love. It is a beehive of honey and stings to be fallen into. That's wonderful, right? Think about a beehive. Eclectic activity, the constant buzz, the fever pitch, pitch of activity. The beehive of, of love. Falling in love is both honey, which you get from beehives, but stings. Falling in love is not just honey. It's not just sweetness and light. Uh, anybody who's fallen in love, even fallen in love with your own children uh, as your babies, fallen in love with God knows that it's not sweet, all, not in this planet, not in this fallen world. It is not all sweetness and light. It is oftentimes stings. To get the honey, you got to get stung. To enjoy the sweetness, you have to be bitten. 
And that's what she can't do. And that's what she's missing. Uh, so ironically, in our world, we take little babies and we immediately strip from them their lightness. We strip from them this airy quality of wonder and, and joy. We take it from them by making them grow up. We want kids to be, it's an old sort of story, but when we were kids, right, we could be out all day. We could be playing eight to 12 hours a day. We could leave in the morning, have breakfast, or go head outside, and we wouldn't come back for 12 hours till it was dinner time. And mom never had to worry where we were, never had to worry that someone was stalking us or that there were people out there that were trying to, to capture or hurt us. That world's gone now, right? As we become more wise and cynical and technological, technological as a society, look what we've done to kids. Nothing more dangerous. And, and even science now is gravitating to this. Little kids constantly on their screens. Little kids constantly before their iPads or their phones or before TV screens. It is a very, very, very surefire way to destroy what is light in them, to take away their light. Make, and bring darkness upon them. But what's remarkable about McDonald's story is it's the opposite problem to start the fairy tale. She is all light, and she has no suffering to set that, right, that light into relief. She, that, light, that, that, that suffering, there's no suffering to bound the joy, which means the joy doesn't mean anything. It's not joy that's been earned. It's not joy that emulates and bubbles up from the sorrow of life, the sorrow of sin. It is an empty joy. Uh, it is light. Light's another, an empty and light are two words that go together, right? Light and empty is what it is. And so in, in this wonderful fairy tale, McDonald starts from the opposite perspective. And I think his point is, if you're going to be too light or too heavy as a little one, definitely be too light. Heaviness will come. But the problem with the princess is, is she's 17 years old now, and the heaviness hasn't come. Go back to the quote. So perhaps the best thing would have been for her to fall, but how a princess who had no gravity could fall into anything is difficult. Perhaps it is the difficulty. As for her own feelings on the subject of love, she did not even know that there was such a beehive of honey and stings to be fallen into. So what do we have? This is one of the most beautiful passages, beautiful premises in the entire fairy tale. The castle is surrounded by a watery moat, and there is a wonderful lake right outside the castle, a beautiful, deep, crystal blue lake. And it fi by, one, by virtue of an accident, they were all out boating one day, the king and all his retainers, and they had the baby, and the nurse was holding on to the baby, and they were uh, um, out there having a picnic on their boats in the water. When a mishap occurred, uh, one boat bumped into another boat, which caused the, the nurse holding the baby to tumble over the side into the water, at which point the baby went into the water. And lo and behold, water, by in, submitting the baby in water, the princess, she got her gravity back in water. She had depth in water, submerged under the water. She had weight only when she was in the water. So consequently, her favorite thing in the whole wide world became swimming. She, would, she had to be dropped in. Somebody had to put her into the water because otherwise she couldn't fall into it. But once she was in the water, she would swim like a duck. She would shoot back and forth across the lake. It was a marvel to behold, as, the quote, as this quote shows us. The palace was built on the shores of the loveliest lake in the world. And the princess loved this lake more than father or mother. And see, that's a problem, isn't it? Um, it almost seems cruel. But you can't accuse the princess of cruelty. When she was laughing at the, the, the murdered general, right, or the fact that she loves the lake more than her father or mother, the thing is, is that all the, sor all the human sorrows of the world could not give her gravity. Her mama and, dada, mama and dad couldn't give her gravity. They were unable to convey it to her. They were unable to pass it on through her after the curse of make them know it. And human suffering does not deepen her, doesn't give her gravity. But when she's in that water, she has it. The palace was built on the shores of the loveliest lake in the world, and the princess loved this lake more than father or mother. The root of this preference, no doubt, although the princess did not recognize it as such, was that the moment she got into it, she recovered the natural right of which she had been so wickedly deprived, namely gravity. Gravity, I love that. Gravity is a right. 
It is the right of all humans to feel, to suffer, and to grow. But she had been deprived it. Her body, her light, weightless body might have grown to adulthood, but her soul never had. Neither had her heart or her mind had the opportunity to grow. We know, right, that everything we do in life that's worth doing is painful. To grow in, to become, to love people better, we have to fail at love. To love people better, we have to suffer for love. Uh, to, to work out, you want to become uh, big and buff. The only way you build muscle is to tear up the old muscle. You have to shred existing muscle to be able to grow. No pain, no grain. The smallest seed, right, seedling, has to push itself painfully through the dirt to reach the light of the sun. You want to become a scholar. You want to learn something, a trade. You want to master a profession. You have to study. Studying's hard. You got to turn off the TV, turn up, tell your friends to not come around. You have to focus. You have to shut out the world around you and concentrate, and that is painful. Every meaningful thing we become in life, we come through, we become through suffering. And in this case, the child's right to suffer has been taken from it by the curse of make him know it. And because of that, she has no gravity. She, again, her mind, body, and soul are not able to grow. Uh, her body grows physically, but it doesn't weigh anything more. She weighs as much as an adult as she weighed as an infant because there is no real growth there. Whether this was owing to the fact that water had been employed as the means of conveying? Who knows? Is it because through the curse of water, the baptism, that she lost her weight, maybe putting her in the weight? Whether this fact that she could get her gravity back in the water, whether this was owing to the fact that the water had been employed as the means of conveying the injury? I do not know. But it is certain that she could swim and dive like the duck that her old nurse said she was. And what's remarkable about that is, is, is that's a perfect place to sort of uh, pull back for a second. Um, it, it's wonderful. What's going to happen is, is the fairy tale prince. There's going to be a fairy tale prince who is wandering the world seeking for his true love, that woman he's destined to marry in true fairy tale uh, fashion. And he's lost and he's, uh, he's become poor. All his resources are gone. Uh, and so he's been stripped. This royal prince has been stripped to nothing more than a common boy who is ser searching the woods. And one day, he's going to find her. He's going to find her in that water. And uh, remarkable things are going to begin to happen. Go to our last set of quotes. When she was in the water, so, and, and notice the little subheading I created here. Tears are water too. And that's going to play big. The, the, the suffering that leads to tears, that makes us grow, that gives us weight, that allows us to become what God wants us to be, tears are water too. So remarkable was water's effects upon her, especially in restoring her for the time to the ordinary human gravity that the king's advisors argued if water of external origin and application could be so efficacious, if outside water could give her back her gravity, water from a deeper source might work a perfect cure. In short, the philosopher said to the king, that if the poor afflicted princess could by any means be made to cry, she might recover her lost gravity. That's beautiful. Remember, the first thing that she did when she was born as any little princess, as a pretty a little princess, has ever cried. And it was her crying as a little girl before she was cursed by the princess. It was her crying uh, that made her really their little human girl. And she has not been able to cry since. And so it seems kind of cruel, right? But the philosophers say, well, look, if submerging her in water, just generic water in the lake, if that is so efficacious as to give her back some sense of weight and feeling, what if we were to make her cry? And those tears, the, 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 the substance of tears shed in sympathy, empathy, uh, maybe that would give her back her lost gravity. But how was this to be brought about? To make the princess cry was as impossible as to make her way. And that's your problem, isn't it? To make the princess cry was just as difficult as to make her way. They sent for a professional beggar somebody who uh, was ex skill, skilled in the arts of poverty. They sent for a professional beggar, commanded him to prepare his most touching oracle of woe. 
and he put on a play for her, right? They dressed him up in beggarly clothes, and he talked about how sorrowful his life was, his deprived childhood, the misery, the suffering. They sent for a professional beggar, commanded him to prepare his most touching oracle of woe, but it was all in vain. She listened to the mendicant artist's story and gazed at his marvelous makeup till she could contain herself no longer and went into the most undignified contortions for relief, shrieking, positively shrieking with laughter. It's amazing, isn't it, that the way we end it here, uh, the, this idea that in spite of everything, the tales of woe, murder, oppression, uh, she didn't even love her mother and father because she had no way to love them, no way to understand it. And so that's where we leave the Light Princess for today. When we return for the final segment, we'll take a long, in-depth look at how, through love, falling in love, the princess is going to get all her gravity back, but it's not going to come easy. And that prince is going to pay a, pay a, t- a terrible toll to get that girl, that young princess, to feel again. So hope you're enjoying this. And uh, uh, you're beginning to see in The Light Princess how everything we did the first two days, the first two hours of lecture, is being pulled in here. You're beginning to see how it all functions. And I hope you already recognize how much fairy tales have to say to adults, not just to kids. So with that in mind, we'll see you with the end of The Light Princess next week. <laughs>